picture, if you will, the snug seclusion of a candle-lit study at Gaylord College, Oxbridge, on a stormy night in late December, almost a hundred years ago, where Oxbridge academic and confirmed bachelor, the Reverend Professor Dr. Montgomery Mablethorpe Zuma, is seated on a Chesterfield wing-back chair before a roaring log fire to share the ritual of ghost stories over a Christmas bowl of smoking bishop with his coterie of young, fresh-faced student acolytes. Setting aside his cup of steaming punch, he opens the dusty tome that rests upon his knees and begins to read in a mellifluous voice. The Curse of the Purple Helmet by J. R. Dullard A Victorian ghost story of sorts in the oral tradition as read by Sir Christopher Lurch. The tale I am about to relate is one of such unmitigated terror. It will likely rock you to your very foundations. Beware the faint-hearted. It is the tale of the very Reverend Benjamin Doom, who came to a decidedly odd end. This tale was related to me by Archdeacon Henry Fiddler Diddlesworth, a venerable character whose veracity is, of course, beyond question. The Brighton Marine Palace and Pier, commonly known as Brighton Pier or the Palace Pier, is a famed pleasure pier in Brighton, England, and not to be confused with any other Brighton Marine Palace and Pier, or Brighton Pier or Palace Pier in any other Brighton in any other far-flung part of the globe. Costing an unprecedented £27,000 to build, it was opened with much pomp and ceremony on the 20th of May in the year of our Lord 1899 by Lady Mayoress Mary Stafford. Many notable dignitaries were in attendance for the grand opening that day. Not least, famed antiquarian and very Reverend Benjamin Doon Esquire, who had taken the opportunity to invite his young friend, gentleman farmer Geoffrey Longpole along, to share his seaside lodgings as companion. It was a decision he would come to heartily regret, though not for the reasons you might imagine. Public lavatories had been installed on the pier, a wonder of modern technology that served to draw the curious from near and far. Both men availed themselves of the public facilities on more than one occasion, and, indeed, deemed them more than satisfactory. As was noted at great length and in great detail in Doom's personal diary, a tome which would have doubtless scandalised his relatives, but which had, in the event, fortunately, come into the safe possession of the aforementioned archdeacon. As the evening drew in, a series of eight iron and steel arches were spectacularly illuminated by 3,000 light bulbs and met by a collective gasp from the awestruck populace. It was at this point that Doon and his young ward linked arms and began a leisurely stroll along the lengthy, quivering promenade. Kiosks selling souvenirs and confectionery were in abundance, as were a plethora of entertainment stalls interspersed with the odd fortune-teller. And there was no fortune-teller odder than Madame Gypsy Rosalinda, nor any curtained entrance quite so strangely enticing. Young Geoffrey begged an audience, and the reverend indulged him, despite it being against his religion. Geoffrey entered only to exit ashen-faced a mere twenty minutes later, refusing to speak, other than to stutter that if the coppers got wind of what she'd said, then they were done for. <laughs> this was just before his knees gave way. As the Reverend tried to steady a swooning Geoffrey, they were approached from the direction of the gentleman's excuse me by a muscular vagabond, known locally as Coalhole Jack. At first the Reverend thought Jack had come to their aid, but despite having the body of a Spartan warrior, the stranger offered no physical support, but instead stepped back deferentially and bowed. Good evening, gentlemen, Jack tipped his cap. 
I understand you is interested in religious artifacts. Jack paused. The Reverend cautiously nodded. His reputation must have gone before him. Might ye then be at all interested in a gander at my purple helmet, Jack inquired. Tis a rare and handsome object, so it is. Once seen can never be unseen. Of that I can assure you. The Reverend's interest piqued. He nodded without a moment's hesitation, winked at a suddenly revived Geoffrey, and the pair followed Jack at speed as he led the way at a clip. The initial part of the jaunt was exceedingly pleasant, with both gentlemen enjoying the view of Jack from behind. His trousers did seem unusually tight, and whilst not entirely comfortable to the wearer, were not without their merits. It was only as the jaunt continued and the bright lights of the seafront were left behind, however, that the gentlemen felt a growing sense of unease. As Jack led them down ever darker and more dismal streets and back passages, they grew increasingly afeard of robbery, or worse, but that was to prove the least of their worries. Finally, they arrived unscathed at a dilapidated tenement. Jack led them into the cobbled courtyard and advising them to mind the rats on a foot, he entered an outhouse being used as a curl hole. When he reappeared, Jack held aloft a lantern in his left hand, and in his right a rough hessian sack, from which he went on to produce the famed purple helmet as promised. The reverend's eyes glittered with interest in the lamplight, having heard of a local legend about a purple mitre, the principal liturgical headdress of the long-deceased Cardinal Agamemnon of Hove. It was said that the fabled headdress protected the country from being consumed by the flames of the fiery furnace. More worryingly, this item of apparel was reputedly linked to a host of malevolent angels who were sworn to guard the mitre at all costs. But how could it be? The mitre had been considered lost for centuries. Jack stated that he found it whilst picking his way through the local slag heap, but had felt stalked ever since by its supernatural guardians to the point of utter desperation. Both the Reverend and Longpole were so moved by the tears that suddenly sprang from the ruffian's eyes and rolled down his manly cheeks, that they decided there and then to take it off his hands for three and twopence. A generous recompense, indeed, for such a potentially troublesome item. And it was only later that they repented at leisure in their four-poster bed, shared, you understand, for cost and convenience, that both Doon and his companion began to have some appreciation of being under surveillance by a supernatural presence. The next day, as they breakfasted on devil kidneys, Doom was alarmed to see the headline on the front page of the local newspaper. Having hurriedly read the accompanying article, he then informed his companion in a tremulous voice that Jack was dead. A night watchman stated therein that he had looked on in horror as Jack had taken a running jump off the much-acclaimed pier and had plunged beneath the icy wave as if the hounds of hell were at his heels. But that wasn't the end of it. Shortly upon Doon returning to his own country seat and his friend to his Sussex estate, the very reverend's companion was discovered dead in a barn on his farmland, having had, or so the police were to conclude, an unfortunate accident with a newfangled milking machine. It was further reported by the distraught farm manager Albert Tosser, who was unfortunate enough to find his dead master, that he appeared to have been drained of all his bodily fluids and was left nothing more than a husk of his former self. His master's face twisted and frozen into a grotesque mask of what, a grim-faced tosser said, could only be described as abject terror. Inconsolable, the very Reverend Doom retired into seclusion, wanting nothing more than the solitude in which to grieve. His place of refuge, a country manor, placed within its own extensive grounds and first built of pale red brick in the 17th century by his esteemed forebears. It had recently been remodelled in the Italian style 
thanks to a sizable inheritance that Dune had not many years before been fortunate enough to come into. A white stucco fascia had been added with portico and marble columns to frame the entrance and through which one was led directly into an impressive hall that reached up to the roof, with gallery and all bedecked with trophies Dune had brought back from his frequent trips to Tuscany and such foreign parts as was to be allowed an independent man of means with a taste for the finer things in life. One of those trophies was a reproduction statue of Michelangelo's David. Twice life-size and with a significantly enlarged appendage, it dominated the hall, which was particularly unfortunate at this time of grieving, as, whenever he looked at it, it inevitably reminded Doon of his dear departed Longpo. But at least he comforted himself, it gave him somewhere to hang his coat to dry, when he returned from his frequent solitary forays outdoors in the rain. Today was no exception, and yet it was exceptional. What had started as a light drizzle as he set off on his daily sojourn through the shrubbery had suddenly turned into a torrential downpour that had caught him short and sent him sprinting for the shelter of the portico. The sky had grown unusually dark as black storm clouds had gathered overhead and the wind had whipped itself up into a rage that showed little sign of abating. Yet it was strangely quiet in the hall once the door had been slammed shut this particular late evening. More so than usual, as, it being the third Friday of the month, his servants were enjoying their afternoon off visiting family in the neighbouring villages, as was their custom. Having changed out of his damp clothes, the Reverend took a cold supper in the library that had been placed there upon his desk at his instructions by his manservant of many years' service, one Archibald Strop. He must have been in a melancholy frame of mind, having lately written in his diary that he was now determined henceforth to keep the location of the diabolical mitre secret, and would forever rue the day he had ventured into the darker recesses of Jack's coal hole. And yet it is perhaps curious to report that it also seems he decided to wear the mitre one last time, as he sat down in his library to dine. As is often the case in tales such as these, it was the sad destiny of the manservant Strop to discover his master's fate. When he first entered the library early the next morning to clear the salver, china and silver service, nothing had seemed amiss, Grop later reported. Only that the coal scuttle was empty and he had made a mental note to refill it from the Hessian bag that had been dropped off at the kitchen door just the day before by parties unknown. It was only as he leaned down to poke the embers of the fire that his eyes snapped open in mortal terror at the sight of his master's skeleton, burnt to a crisp among the ruins of the coal with a charred purple band circling the throat.